Welcome to the Gateway. We're so glad you're here today. Thank you for those of you who are joining online. We are awesomely happy that you're here. These are good days to travel with Jesus, isn't it, guys? Amen. Isn't it nice you look around and you see God's hands at work in the creation and also in our relationships, Lord. Every every interaction that you have is divine. That's just I've been overcome with that lately. Divine and an opportunity to uh, make a difference and to be a blessing. So thank you for coming today. Got a few announcements, and then uh, Dana will come up to share the word. Uh, I want to encourage you guys to invite your friends. We have um, a good group here, and enjoy. Can you guys still hear me now? No. Okay, let me turn this back on. There you go. We, we encourage you to invite your friends. Um, uh, we're here every Sunday. You can visit live. You can visit online. Uh, we just love that. So I love your smiling faces and the great opportunity that we have to have community here. Yeah. Um, and we want to pray for you. So if you have a prayer request, you can text your prayer need to Catherine. The number's on the screen there, 619-559-6540. I'm getting too much feedback, Cheryl. You're going to have to use the other mic. It just is not cooperating. All right, so let's see. And that is I have the power. All right, you ready? Now you have power. Go ahead okay, I have the power again. Yeah. Can you guys hear me again? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, man, I'm feeling really special right now. <laughs> can you guys see me on the camera? Yeah, you're in, you're in, you're in Being a whopping five foot tall with a husband who's six foot three, it has its own unique challenges with the camera, especially. So, all right. So, yeah, if you have a prayer need, please um, share your prayer request um, via text message to Catherine, and we have a team that will pray for you. Oh yeah. And we also meet every every Sunday morning at nine thirty here at the gateway and we have a really good time praying uh, it's if, if you guys need prayer want prayer um, that's a great community there to be in yeah. and your midweek oasis wednesday nights at 5 30 we have a bible study here it's very interactive along with worship um, so yeah it's a great if you uh, are able to come you will be blessed it's a lot of fun and it's posted online as well on uh, thursday thursday mornings and then life and connect groups, connect and build relationships. So we just started our next uh, season of uh, life and connect groups. And uh, Mike Dillman and Tammy Dillman, they are leading a group. So um, you can only get so much um, interaction and fellowship on a Sunday morning. And sometimes you just want a little more. Um, yeah. And Mike and Tammy, they have a really good group that's here meeting in SQUIM on Sundays twice a month, or su Saturday evenings twice a month. They just yeah. had a meeting last night. They'll have a meeting two Saturdays from now. Um, reach out to Mike. There's his phone number, 406-439-6076. Or wave your hand, Mike and Tammy. Those are your people. Like, just go say, hey, hey, I want to come at your house. They have food. They have fellowship. They, they do fun stuff. And they also pray. And they're yeah. serious about God and serious about community. So we just love them and appreciate them and what they do. And if you want to be connected, that's a great place to go. Yeah. Like, it's really awesome. And Dana's going to come up and share the word now. Thank you, God, for this opportunity for us to gather to, yeah. today. You, we welcome you here. We, we uh, intentionally choose to open up our ears and open up our hearts. God, we ask that you'd speak to us. Lord, and we thank you for the nuggets we're going to be receiving today, those gold nuggets that we need, Lord, to help us on our journey. We give you praise. You, Amen. 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 See, I don't do this very much. <laughs> stuff's lower. Looks like somebody was using the pulpit here. Look at that. I almost need my glasses. I think I can roll with it. I want to read you guys something. Can, can everybody have a lighthearted moment today? Can we, all, can we all laugh? Are you sure you can laugh today? Or is everything too serious? You know, laughter's good for us, isn't it, church? And I'm sure you can hear me okay without the mic, correct? Okay, good. Yeah, I don't really need the mic, I don't think. Let me read a text interaction I had yesterday. I was thinking about this, and I said, well, this might rub some people a little bit wrong, 
But if it rubs you wrong, that's a Jesus moment, okay? <laughs> Remember when, I, when an emotion rises, you better say, whoa! Yeah. Holy Spirit, what is that? Is that something we need to work on? So if something rises in you, that's when you and God, not you and me, okay? <laughs> Praise God. I do have to have my glasses for this. Okay. You know, it's, it's like if it isn't over 14 font, uh -huh. I'm having problems now. <laughs> all my outlines, are, you, I know you guys get scared because it looks like I'm coming up here with a novel, yeah. but all my fonts are 18 now. <laughs> that way I can preach without my glasses. So, praise God. So, yeah, my outlines keep getting longer and longer, but there's really not more content. They're just more pages. But, uh, <laughs> praise God. But uh, listen to this, um, my, our, our daughter-in-law, you know, she lives with us and one of our grandkids. And so she went back home to Montana to visit family. So, and I said, please check in and let me know that you made it okay. So let me read this interaction I have with her. Okay. She said, got through security, but they had to take our toothpaste over three ounces. Uh, <laughs> and then here's my response. Wow. I guess that's part of the process to enforce social distancing. <laughs> and then just to make sure that I didn't rub her wrong, I said, just joking. Isn't that funny when we have to hedge a joke in, a good clean joke, we have to hedge it in because people are so on edge now. Yeah, no kidding. But she, uh, she, she said, laugh out loud. So I just thought that was something oh, worth saying. Because, <laughs> you know, if I would have said that, it would have pushed some people's button, yeah. and then they'd have got on a platform, and they'd have really made a point out of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought you guys would appreciate that. <laughs> you know, we need to laugh a whole lot more, don't we, church? Yeah. Stay sweet. Stay nice. Yeah. Stay kind. Yeah. Be like Jesus. Amen. Jesus was about the Father's business, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was. He was about the Father's business. And I promise you, in Jesus' day, uh, there was a lot of, of, of bad, nasty things going on, wasn't there? Yeah. Was the Roman government a great government? Did they take good care of the people? Were they nice to Christians? No, they were not. But what did Jesus do? He went around and loved people. He healed the sick. He blessed people. He preached the gospel. He was about Father's business. You know, let somebody else be nasty if they want to. But you guys be about Father's business. So, yeah, mm, amen. I'm going to keep touching this until we get out of this season, guys. So just be just be expecting, oh, Dana's probably going to touch it again. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to stay nice, darn it. <laughs> so do, please, please do it. I'm doing it too, I promise you. I'm not just uh, suggesting and asking and encouraging and pushing these things a little bit on everybody else. I'm doing it too. Yeah. All right, so we're going to jump into the Word today. Blessings to the thousandth generation. Blessing to the thousandth generation. All right. So, you know, everyone makes mistakes, don't they? Okay. Some. Some. I like that answer. He said some. Chuck, you just need to lay hands on all of us and pray, brother. Give us that grace on your life, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a good answer. But all of us do. All of us make mistakes. Let's take it a step further. Everybody has sinned against God, haven't they? Everybody has. All of us have sinned. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory, of fallen short of God's standard and God's requirements. Everybody has. But see, uh, we don't just have a sin problem, guys. We have a sin nature, don't we? It, it's literally part of the fabric of our being. You know, if, you, if, if somebody makes a quilt and it's beautiful, um, that's very much like our life. Our life is like a quilt, a tapestry that's been sewn together, and some of those threads have sin nature in them. They do, and it's just who we are. It's the fabric of our being. That's why we can't discipline ourselves out of sin. Do you know that? You can't break enough habits to be right with God. <laughs> you, know? you can't make enough life change, enough resolution, man, this year. Yeah, you can resolute yourself right into hell, church. I'm, I'm not kidding. You know, and yeah, I'm preaching the word. I'm, I yeah. hope we're good with that. But the thing is, is resolutions, habit changes. Yeah, they're good and we need to have them, but they don't take the place of Jesus. They can't. They can't, church. They can't. 
And you know what sin nature is? It's actually summed up. It's selfishness expressing itself through us, isn't it? That's what it is. You know, sin is just selfishness, plain and simple. And so, um, you know, all, self, all sin really is choosing to give in to something we want or something that serves us in the moment or something that feels good. That's what it is, a selfishness. But all of us, want, we want what we want. We want to be comfortable. We want to be, have a good quality of life. But the thing is, is, you know, God is for us having a good quality of life. But it might not look exactly what we think sometimes. <laughs> but he is for our best. He always is for our best. And so, you know, that sin nature, where do we get it? Everybody, tell me where you got your sin nature from. Mom and Dad. <laughs> good answer, Don. Mom and Dad. I saw you scratching your head. I don't have a clue. Yeah. <laughs> Mom and Dad. And where did they get it from? Mom and Dad. And where did they get it from? Mom and Dad. And then right on back to it, where did it start? That's right. That's right. We all inherited it. You know, everyone in this room, we're all of the lineage of Adam and Eve. Every one of us. They're our great, 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 great grandparents. <laughs> they are. Yeah. And yes, I have fun up here if you're busy. I have a lot of fun. I mean, what is not fun about Jesus? You know, really. I mean, there's a lot of not fun in the world, but Jesus is fun. Our God is fun. Our God is happy. You understand? Our God is happy. He's not a hard taskmaster looking to spank us. He's a, he's a generous God looking to love us more Amen. and give us more and be nicer to us. He always does his best. We just have to kind of figure out how to sort through our stuff so we can receive it. Uh, so we got it from mom and dads. And it's very much like David said in Psalm 51.5, Lord, I have been a sinner from birth. From the moment my mother conceived me. You see, at conception... That sin nature was woven into our DNA. It just was. It was. And so, you know, for our sin problem, for mankind's sin problem, to be overcome, it required two things. There was two things that had to happen to overcome the sin problem in mankind. It required a flesh and blood person to pass every test and temptation that no other human being had ever passed. You with me? It required flesh because... Flesh inherited the sin nature, so flesh had to overcome the sin nature, church. And it also required a brand new divine bloodline, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And see, the thing is, that that's why Jesus had to come and be born of a virgin, born of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a fleshly person, because he had to bring a new bloodline into a fleshly mess yeah. and overcome it. Isn't that good? That's why I was born of a virgin. I mean, God could have said from heaven, uh, okay, uh, if you'll do this and this, you can be right with me. But no, see, God doesn't go around his word. He doesn't go around his requirements. You understand? Amen. That's why Jesus had to fulfill everything. He had to fulfill every scripture, every prophecy, everything. And a, sin came in through human flesh, and it had to go out through human flesh. That's why Jesus was born of a, of a, of a lady, of Mary. And his wonderful Mary, his mother Mary, uh, she was a flesh and blood person just like us. She was. She was privileged to give birth to the Messiah. She was really blessed to do that. But she was just like us. She was a person. And, of course, she, and then she became uh, pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible says here in Romans 5, 19, one man's disobedience, we've already touched this, but I want to hit it again, one man's disobedience opened the door for all humanity to become sinners. So also, by one man's obedience, opened the door for many to be made perfectly right with God and acceptable to him. Isn't that neat? Jesus. You know, Adam, Adam and Eve uh, messed up the human race. But Jesus, he made a way for us to be right with God. He made a way to be right with God. Praise God. Mm. And so, for us, church, here's something for us right now. John 3, 5, this is Jesus. He says, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. And I underline both of those. Church, you can't enter the kingdom unless you're born of the water of the womb of a mom and of the Spirit of God. Or you have to have a second birth, church. 
You have to be reborn from above. And that's when the Holy Spirit, that's when you trust Christ as Lord and the Holy Spirit comes and lives in your life. Then you're born of the Spirit, and then you can enter the kingdom of heaven. But you have to be born both ways, don't we? And that's why the Bible says it's appointed unto people one time to die. You know, we don't have to die twice, church. And we're born. We're going to die one time in the flesh. That's a, that's kind of a requirement. The body's going to wear out. <laughs> Any of you got a few more aches and pains this year than you had last year? Yeah, yeah. You know, our, the creation longs longs to be redeemed. You know that, and that's us too. We're create. We're part of the creation. Our bodies are longing to be redeemed. Our bodies are longing for Jesus' return. Our bodies are longing for things to be made right. And in that longing, there's a there's a, a travailing and a toiling in these bodies because they're like, man, I want to hurry up and get to heaven. <laughs> and I'm okay with that because guess what? My heart and my soul want to hurry up and get to heaven too. I don't want to leave here too fast. But the thing is, is I'm, how many of you want to enjoy a glorified body? Oh, yeah. yeah. Amen. Imagine not <laughs> no aches and pains, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering. No more sleep deprivation or whatever. I mean, you're just going to get up there and it's going to be great. You, every day is great. Amen. There is no night there. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Um, but see, we have to be born of the Holy Spirit. And when we trust Christ, we're born again of imperishable seed, of an imperishable bloodline, of a sinless bloodline. And so at the moment we, we, we trust Christ, we come to the cross, we trust Christ, you know, we show up with everything we had and everything we are, don't we, at the cross. We show up and we say, Jesus, man, what I got ain't working that good. You know, all of us have a moment. And I've, I've shared this a lot. I'm not going to go through the, the whole teaching on it. But there's a moment in your soul to where you see what God's offering you. And you see what you got. And it's like the scale, the balance beam, you know, the balance beam scale. It's like you see what God's offering you and you see what you got. And, and you look at it, and then the God side goes, yeah. God's offered me something a whole lot better than what I got. And that's that, that revelation moment when Father draws to the cross, and the Holy, the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and separates. You know, Hebrews talks about separating. Yeah. It divides the soul and the spirit. It divides the things of God from things of the flesh. Yeah. And in that moment, we say, ooh, okay, the things of the spirit look really good. The things of my flesh aren't that good. I want Jesus. And then we pray. And we call on the name of the Lord, and then we're saved. It's, it's that simple. You ask, you receive. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. But everything at that moment, we bring, we're, we're in that moment, we're like, we show up with our sin-filled life, our sin-filled whatever. Don't matter how good or bad you are, you still don't, you still got some stuff in there that needs to be dealt with. At that moment, we show up, and Jesus forgives us of every, from that moment back, as far back as we first sinned and knew what we were doing, we're forgiven. Isn't that neat? Mm -hmm. Every sin prior to the cross is covered in the blood. It's covered in the blood, church. Completely covered in the blood. Not to be remembered anymore, not to be seen anymore, and not to be talked about anymore. God won't bring up your past stuff before the cross. Do you know that? If stuff before the cross comes up, you brought it up or the devil brought it up because Jesus don't bring it up. If you got, seriously, if you've been forgiven for a sin before that, yeah, you may still have to walk some stuff out because all of us do. But God's not going to remind you. You remember your past? You remember that nasty thing? No. No, there's no there's no condemnation. There's no shame to those who are in Christ. Everything before the cross is washed in the blood. So we show up. We're forgiven. But then at that, from then on begins the lifelong process. Basically from the time you trust Christ until your body says, I'm done. Jesus returns. Whatever. From then to then, that block of life that you have that God gave you, is the day-to-day -day salvation, the sanctification part. So you got your eternal life at the cross, but we're constantly being saved from things over our, our life. You with me? And that's called sanctification, simply put. All right, and that's a whole, uh, every one of these are individual teachings, but I'm kind of, I'm, I'm going somewhere today. And so over our life, you know, we run into attitudes, run into nasty stuff, whatever, and the Lord says, see that? Doesn't he, Autumn? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to do that, but I just had to. But no, but you got a victory. That's right. She got a win, church. That's, that's right. a win. Amen. Every time the Holy Spirit speaks to us and we do what He says, that's a win. Yeah, that's huge. And see, that's where we're at, church. 
is every time the Lord raise, something raises up, so we see something, God shows us something, something comes out of us that's nasty. That is a God moment for yeah. you to be set free from something. Yeah. And that's called sanctification. And that's what it is. Our life is a journey of being set free from things that hurt us, yeah. things that damage us, things that hurt those around us that come out of us. And that's what sanctification is. So it's really neat. <clears throat> you know, I wish, I really wish, I wish at the cross, I wish whenever we trusted Christ, I wish that everything was dealt with. And we just coasted out of there. For just yeah, Seriously, we just coasted out of there with no more sin problem, no more issues, no more selfishness. How many of you would like to have a little less selfishness? Oh. Are you bold enough to raise your hand? Yeah. Yes. Yes. But see, God doesn't do that, does he? Because if he did that, our relationship with him would stay at an infant level. Do you understand? Only through partnering with him and working through those things do we grow. Yeah. I mean, when everything's perfect and nothing's going on, we're on the mountain, we don't grow a lot. Yeah. But we're in the valley and things are rough and tough and we don't, we can't see daylight and it's cloudy and things are rough. And then we say, God, help! Then the relationship grows. <laughs> That's why he chose to do it that way. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so remember, we're talking about blessings to the thousandth generation, church. So in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4 and 5, it really gives us a picture of what God's doing in our life. It really does. You know, it's happening, and put it this way, it's happening now in your life. It'll be happening tomorrow in your life. It'll be happening next year in your life. It's happening in my life. Nobody's exempt. Just because I'm a pastor don't mean I ain't working on stuff often. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you and say, oh, I got it all figured out. Boy, you're really messed up. If anybody does that, you need to go somewhere else. <laughs> Because just when I think I'm like, God, I'm doing really good, it's like, oh, and like I talked about last week, remember, and, and those of you who are visiting may think this is strange, but I taught it on, on abundant manure last week. Yeah. Manure. Because that's what life throws at us, and that's what the devil throws at us. But like I said last week, manure is the chosen fertilizer to make us grow. Yeah. So, yes, I get hit with manure, too. Yeah. And, yes, it stinks and it's nasty. Yeah. But the thing is, is when it happens, remember what I said last week? Yeah. I said, do like the, the church, the, like the, the, the city people did in Jerusalem yeah. on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and it rattled the town. They ran to the disciples and says, what does this mean right. and what shall we do? Mm -hmm. So whenever you get hit with that big clot of manure, say, what does this mean, God, and what shall I do? <laughs> All right. Amen. But, but this... Isaiah really does a good job talking about what happens in our life over the course of our life. I'm talking from the cross to your redemption, from the cross to your resurrection or Jesus' return. Here's what Jesus is doing in your life, church, and in mine. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Church, you got low spots in your life. you got struggles in your life. God's trying to give you a victory so you can raise up above that. That's the valley that he's lifting, that low spot in your life where you need Jesus more. And every mountain and hill, you got a little pride and arrogance going on. You, you, you're, you're right a little too often. God's going to bring that down because guess what? The valley has to be filled with Jesus, and the mountain has to be filled with Jesus, so there's, they're going to do this and come to a nice, lovely, high place for you to live. And crooked places shall be made straight. Crooked. You know, that's, the, that's exactly what perverted means. And do you know the devil has been perverting what God created since, since far back, at, well, since Adam and Eve blew it? Do you know that? The devil has never created anything. You guys, you've heard me say this. He's never created anything. He took what was good, perfect, and beautiful and perverted it and twisted it and made it crooked. That's what the devil's done. Because, see, he tries to steal, kill, and destroy. You with me? He doesn't create anything. He tries to take what's good and mess it up. And that's why he tries to mess us up. But, see, that's the crooked place. The crooked places are where you, in your life is where you're believing a lie as the truth. And until God shines his truth in, it can't be made straight. You with me? The truth of God always replaces lies. Yeah. And so that's the crooked place. It's the place where you believed a lie and, it, and it's twisted you and it's messing you up. And I, I got to say this. 
do you know whenever, when do you see a lie for what it is? When do you see a lie for being a lie? Come on, you're a smart group. Give me something. When something gets revealed. Something gets revealed. What up? Who? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. Let me. We saw things one way and then we saw things a different way. That's right. That's right. Those are good answers, guys. Let me add just a hair to that. Yes, Mike. That's good. Mm -hmm. All those are great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When you see a lie for a lie is when it's put under stress. Huh. You with me? Okay. A lie looks perfectly good when you're on the mountaintop. Mm. A lie falls apart when you're under stress and under load and under heavy demand. Because a lie will not support you in a tough spot. Do you know that? Mm. Okay. A lie will not take you into a victory. You see a lie for what it is whenever your life's falling apart or things are tough. Yeah. And you try to rely on the lie to give you a win or lead you through, and it falls apart. Yeah. That's how the Holy Spirit will reveal it, and then the truth comes in and gives you the strength. A lie is always revealed under pressure, church. Yeah. Thank you for the good answers. Yeah. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, um, about our process. We're going, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit. Our process from the cross forward, church. And, um, I, you know, whenever somebody trusts Christ as Savior, have you ever noticed that, man, they just walk in a glory season? Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. It was that way for me. I had major digestive problems. Like, seriously, I had a, I had a bleeding ulcer at nine years old due to my dysfunctional family. Mm -hmm. And so, and I had all kind of digestive problems. And when I trusted Christ, the next morning I woke up and he had healed my digestive problems. Wow. I didn't ask him for it. I didn't pray for years about it. He just did it. He just did it. But that's what he does. When somebody comes to, into the kingdom, he just does all this stuff for them. And, uh, and it's great. But do you understand what he's doing? He's building relationship. See, that's, the, that's really what the Holy Spirit's doing is whenever you first trust Christ and for a short season after, I call it the honeymoon phase. You with me? <laughs> More or less, you know, and your, your head's in the clouds, everything's glorious, it's sweet, it's wonderful. God's just meeting all your needs. You pray, and before you even get done praying, it happens. It's great. And, but the thing is, is he wants to dig you deep into Jesus as quick as possible. So that way, what happens? He's building faith. It's a faith season, a faith building season. That way, when he really starts working on things that would hurt or be difficult to deal with, you're, you're, you're in Christ deep enough to where you don't throw it, you know, take, pack up your toys and, and do something else. You with me? Imagine if he started getting into deep issues the day after you trusted Christ. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, too much! <laughs> yeah. All of us would. Yeah. But what he does, there's a time of this grace season, this extra measure season, where he just comes through. That way we get much more closer to God and much more intimate. Yeah. Then we're in a position of faith and trust and hope and relationship for him to start going deeper and deeper little by little. Mm -hmm. All right? And then the next layer he does, after, after the honeymoon season, he'll start dealing with surface-level things, which is attitudes, actions. Well, you had, a, you had a pretty crappy attitude right there. Or, you, you, or, you know, you weren't very nice right there. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm glad you're at. Normally she's in with the children. You know, hey, all, of, all I can say is I see God all over this. <laughs> We have a good time. Yes. We have a good time, church. But the thing is, is attitudes, actions, and habits, normally that's the first layer God will get into yeah. because, yes, they require change, but it's not hard. Yeah. You know, you can change a habit fairly easy. Yeah. You can stop doing something that's not good for you pretty easy. You with me? If you got a pretty nasty attitude, normally you can kind of, you know, you, God can kind of put a guardrail up and kind of say, come on out of that, come on out of that, yeah. and we can deal with it. Then he goes deeper. He'll start. Then, that's when he starts asking more questions. That next level. Why did you do that? Yeah. You with me? Yeah. Why did you do that? Why did you say that? Why do you want that? Mm. You see what I'm saying? There's layers. There's layers within the sanctification process. But the stronger you get, the deeper God goes. Church. Yeah. You wonder why you've been walking with God for 20 years. You've been just enjoying Jesus and pressing in, mm. and then He starts reaching into the very core of your being. Because you can handle it. Yeah. You, you and Jesus can win there. That's why he does it. Yeah. Amen. 
<laughs> Amen. So motives, desires, and goals is generally that second layer. Next thing is structural things. This is the deeper ones. This is the fabric of our being. Remember I was talking about that quilt? This is the things that, that, that are part of our fabric. These are the things that we inherited from our parents. These are the things we've been doing since we've been doing stuff. The way we've been doing stuff since we've been doing stuff. You with me? It's just so ingrained in us that we don't even think about it subconscious. Those are harder to work on, aren't they? Yeah. Things you've been doing for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. Our 20 years of doing it often is the fabric of our being. Those are th then that's that third layer. God's like, okay, now we're going to really try to, 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 to do a remodel project. We've got to tear some stuff out and put some new stuff in, and it hurts. Yeah. Those structural things hurt. They're painful. And that's why God does those uh, later and not early on. Um, often, and I've, God's done this with me so many times, he's required me to let go of goals and dreams that were really important to me. Really, I mean, I had dreams that were super huge. And God said, I want you to let that go. And what it was, they weren't God goals and they weren't God dreams. You with me? They were things I wanted. But I really wanted them bad. And I wanted them for years and years and years and years. Years and years. And I will give you one, one example. And, and I've shared this several times lately, and I'm not doing this. Just It just keeps coming up in the messages. But actually, I was a martial artist for a long time, over 30 years. And I trained a lot of people over the years. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. My body didn't love it until I started hurting. But I, but I loved it. One day, I, was, I went to the studio. I had a dojo, and I was training people. I went, and when I got out of the car and walked into the school, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, tell your students this is your last class, wow. that you will no longer be training or teaching anyone. He said, I've got something else for you to do. Mm. After 30 years, wow. 32, I don't know how long it was. And so the students came in, and I was like, God, it's like, and I admit, I said, yes, sir. Yeah. I said, yes, sir, I'll do it, God. I was like, God, give me grace, please. Yeah. This, this hurts. Yeah. I love this. I hurt. It, I hurt, Lord, with this. Mm -hmm. And so I told them, I said, guys, I want you to know this. I shared them exactly what, I, what was going on. And most of them were Christians. Some of them weren't. But the thing is, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know? I'm working my out. Like Philippians says, yeah. work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, there are things you and Jesus only can work out. Mm -hmm. And some people around you may not understand it, but you got to do it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And so I share with the students. The one who got the maddest at me was my daughter because she was my senior student at that time. <laughs> Dad! <laughs> and, and I promise you, we've had follow-up conversations yeah, since. Dad, why would you do that? But now she understands because she's a woman of God, and yeah. she understands. But it took a little while. It took longer for it to settle in on her than it did for me, I think. <laughs> but the thing is, is I gave it up, and within a week, the senior pastor of church called me and said, look, I need you and Cheryl to start a marriage ministry. Wow. You see? You be obedient, and God will give you something better. Yeah. He'll give you something better. Praise God. Um, but, you know, church, um, we all have to walk through a lot. We have to deal with a lot. We have to sort through a lot. But I'm telling you, in Jesus, you know, God will never take you somewhere that's not better for you. Do you know that? Wherever he's taking you, if, if, it's, if it's God taking you there, it's going to be better. Yeah. It's going to be better for you, better for me. But there's a cost, church. There's always a cost to mature in Christ. It, there's a cost. You know, the Bible says narrow is the way that leads to life. You know what, you know what narrow means? It means a little bit smaller than you are. You're going to have to leave some flesh yeah. on the door case to get through. Mm -hmm. And then the next narrow way is going to be a little bit smaller than you are. You're going to leave some more flesh behind. Then the next one's going to be teeny tiny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it hurts. Yeah. But every time you step through, you step through into freedom, into a bigger place, into yeah. a better place. Yeah. There's always going to be flesh left behind at every victory, at every promotion, at every step up. And you're never stepping down in the kingdom of God. It may feel like it, but if you're yeah. walking with Jesus, every time you do something or have a win or he takes you into something new, it's always a promotion. Yeah. It always is. Yeah. Amen. So let's, now let's get back into our blessing to the thousandth generation. Right. So even though we had no choice about the sin nature we inherited, none of us none of us chose that. None of us did. It's just part of it. But God still holds us responsible to deal with it. Do you know that? Even though we had no say in receiving it, 
we are held responsible to deal with it. I don't know that I like that process, but <laughs> Exodus 25, the second part, and 6. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, an impassioned God, demanding what is rightfully and uniquely mine. Visiting means avenging the iniquity, the sin and guilt of the fathers on the children. You see that? That is calling the children to account for the sins of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Those who, it means those who despise me or reject me. But showing graciousness, here we go, here's the core of our message today. But showing graciousness and steadfast loving kindness to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You see that? Hey, no matter where you are, the buck stops with you. And if you don't choose to deal with it and draw that line and say, no more, no more, your kids get the, well, the not good privilege of dealing with that. You know, it has to stop somewhere. It's going to keep going. It's, it's in our fabric. It's in our DNA. And let me say this. As soon as you and Jesus get a win in your life, your kids start enjoying the victory. Some people say, no, you got to die first before, before they enjoy it. I heard somebody, somebody tell me that years ago. Said, no, 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 no. As soon as you get a victory because of the authority and the place you have in your children's life. You, do you have authority in your children's life, even if they're not listening to you? <laughs> you do. You're a parent. You have authority to speak life and death. You have, you have, seriously, other than their spouse, you have the greatest authority in their life. Grandparents and parents, you have unbelievable authority. And that isn't just spoken authority. It isn't just actions authority. It's victory authority. Every time you get a win, your kids will receive blessing from your win, even when you're still breathing air. I've seen it. Me and Cheryl have had wins in our life, and immediately I notice our kids that had something certain in their life, they didn't even realize they were struggling with something. It's just normal for them. All of a sudden, they're like, wow, this just really isn't bothering me anymore. And they didn't realize that me and mom had a win in that spot. Isn't that neat? Your victory becomes their blessing immediately, immediately. Isn't that cool? It's motivational too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so what do we need to deal with to set our kids free? Mm. Amen. Um, but see, whenever you get a win, the fabric of their DNA changes. And guess what? It goes right into their offspring and into their offspring and into their offspring. To a thousand, your victory will impact thousands of generations. You with me? No matter how long it is until Jesus returns, every member of your lineage will walk in your victory. Isn't that huge? It's a weighty responsibility, church. I still remember the first prophetic, well, one of the first prophetic words me and Cheryl got. We were in North Carolina. And a part of the word was a man said, you're a tradition breaker. And this was in like the mid-90s. And I was, I was a young Christian. I was like, yeah, woo! And... Uh, <laughs> What I should have said, I should have said, whew, thank you, God. Because, yes, it's a privilege and honor to be a tradition breaker, but it's going to hurt. There's a cost. Somebody's got to pay it. Thank God that, I'm, that he chose me and Cheryl for, for some of that. But there's a heavy cost when you're breaking bloodline things. There's a cost, church, but it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. You, you know, you get your win so your rest of your family don't have to fight things that you can deal with. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. Okay. All right. Amen. Um, but, you know, church, God in his mercy gives every one of us an opportunity to be a tradition breaker. Whether you receive that prophetic word or not, the scripture teaches, hey, do it. Do it. Just do it. Just do it. Don't pray about it. Don't think about it. If something comes up, deal with it and, and be that be that big win for your family. Um, you know, you know what? If you if you've broken any tra any traditions, any bloodline things that were passed down to you, guess what? You know, you're a hero. You're a hero. You are. You're a hero. You're someone to be admired because somebody before you didn't do it. You know that. It wouldn't have came to you if somebody else would have dealt with it. <laughs> so for you to deal with it, that means you dug in your heels, you pressed into Jesus, you did, you did the, the hard stuff, 
Are you with me? You did the hard stuff. You're a hero. You're a hero to Jesus and a hero to me and a hero to your family, even though they may not so, say it or acknowledge it. So I want to kind of share some scripture that really brings this to light. Hebrews is 7, 1 through 3 and verse 9 and 10 of chapter 7. All right, I kind of condense this. You can read the whole, you know, the whole section if you want to on your own. But the writer of Hebrews says, This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham, Abraham the father of faith, returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And look what Abraham did and, and watch this. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. That's where the tithe came in is at that event. A tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem <laughs> means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, I believe this was Jesus, church. He remains a priest forever. Well, here we go. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tent, paid the tent through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Do you see that? The Bible says right here that Levi was tithing through Abraham even though he wasn't born. Well, what do you know? Does that not highlight the importance of lineage, of victories? That's huge. Huge. So guess what? When Levi actually was born and grew up, do you think it was easier for him to tithe or to give or to, to serve because of what his daddy did? Yeah. See, he walked in his daddy's freedom. His daddy's victory, his mama's victory. He walked in those things, church. He didn't have to fight for them. They were already a win. Man, that's a big deal, church. It's a big deal. And let me just say this, guys. If you or I, if we're stingy with our time, our resources, our stuff, our whatever, do you realize that your kids are probably going to be stingy too? If we're generous with our resources, our time, the stuff God's blessed you with, your kids are going to have a tendency to be generous too. You know that? It's huge, church. It's huge. This is a big deal. It's a big deal that we get this, that we understand that, you know, we we got to have wins, church. Yes. We got to have wins. We got to have wins, church. We got to have wins. How many of you here want your kids to walk in more freedom than you've had? Yeah. My gosh. How about your grandkids? You want to see them free? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to see them more open to the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Then you be more open to the Holy Spirit. Do you want to see them respond to God when he speaks to them? Then you respond to God when he speaks to you. When somebody has a need, do you want to see them meet the need generously? Then you meet the need generously. Church, it's huge. This bloodline thing's a big deal. Yeah. That's why you're saved and have eternal life because of a new bloodline. The bloodline thing's big. Yeah. You got eternal life because of a new bloodline. Yeah. I did too. Praise God. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about some of the. Oh, let me let me share one other thing. This is just a quick just a quick testimony uh, that that the Lord actually reminded me of this morning. I wasn't even thinking about this, but uh, my 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 dad has passed on and he went to heaven, yeah. but. I didn't meet my dad. I didn't know who my father was for 27 years. My mom had lied to me and told me it was this man that was absolutely a jerk. He was a mean, nasty, abusive man. And she said he was my dad, which when I found out he wasn't, I was actually quite happy. Right? <laughs> yeah, because he'd abused my mom, my sister, yeah. me. He was just really a mean person. And uh, but when she said, he's not your dad, I said, really? <laughs> you think that's funny but yeah you got you you live in that for years and and you're like you know like well, there's they've got, i hope there's something better but then when I, when I was 27 my dad actually reached out and i didn't know who the man was uh because he was dying with cancer he was in bad shape and he wanted to kind of try to make things right with me before he passed and so i was 27 my mom comes to me and said well this guy's not really your dad i said thank you she said, but this other guy is, I said, who's that? Never heard of him before. She said, well, he wants to meet with you. And I said, okay. I was a Christian, full of the Holy Spirit. I was like, yeah, I want to meet this guy. Oh, he's got cancer. I want to pray with this guy. Yeah. I want to forgive this guy. I want him set free. Yeah, yeah. 
with me. I wasn't mad because he'd been gone for 27 years. Right. That was an opportunity for me yeah. to represent Jesus. Yeah. No, I didn't go to him and fuss at him. Yeah. It's like, man, Jesus loves you. Yeah. Yeah. I remember after our first meeting, he went home and told his, his mom, he said, I can't hardly be around that boy. <laughs> I used to visit with him, and I could feel the anointing. The Holy Spirit would be in the car when we were meeting. He's like, I could tell he was under conviction because yeah. he, you know, he was gone and done all the stuff wrong. And I was just like, man, I love you. This is good. Let's hang out. Yeah. Let's have fun. Let's pray. He's like, <laughs> so yes, I freaked him out. <laughs> Praise God, though. Yeah. But the thing is, is what I noticed. We went out to eat, like our second or third visit. We went out to eat. I didn't know this guy, had never been around, was not raised around him. We went into the restaurant. He and I ordered the same thing. We both liked the same food. Uh, we uh, sat the same way in the chair, uh, propped up the same. I didn't notice it, and I think Cheryl or Cheryl pointed out, my mom did. We had the same mannerisms, the same things, liked the same food. And uh, do you think there might be something to this bloodline thing, church? See, that's proof to me. I had never, I didn't even know this guy, and yeah. we, we acted the same. Yeah. We liked the same stuff, yeah. the same ten, the same mannerisms. Isn't that something? Yeah. That just tells you how strong this stuff really is, church. It's big. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. But kind of closing out that story is with that opened up a whole side of family I didn't know, right. and I met a half-brother and talked with him for eight hours. Mm -hmm. He was demon-possessed. God set him free, and he trusted Christ, my, yeah. my half-brother, and my half brother's the one who led my dad to Christ when he was dying. Wow. Yeah. So he went straight from dropping the flesh off into glory. Yeah. Isn't that neat? Yeah. God's got a plan, church. He does. He's got a plan. Yeah. But some of these examples of negative family traits, and, and you guys know this, is drug addiction. Yeah. And please, that can be prescription or non prescription drugs. Right. Just because somebody has MD at the end of their name mm -hmm. and they prescribe something to you, you can still get strung out on it. Or non-prescription drugs. It can be alcoholism. It can be spending addictions. It can be a poverty spirit. Yeah. It can be a sickness that just has run through your family for generations. Mm -hmm. The doctors know that. Why do you think they have that form when you go in there? Has your father or anybody in your family ever had this? Mm -hmm. You know what? That whole paper is based on bloodline curses and bloodline blessings and bloodline stuff. That's where that paper came from. Yeah. Isn't that something? So... Here's some questions. I got a few questions for you. You game for some questions? Oh, yeah. Now, we're not going to answer those out loud. These are for you to answer. All right, here we go. <laughs> questions and thoughts to expose negative bloodline issues. And there are other, other ones. It's just a small list, church. I've always been this way. Yeah. What way? Right. Yeah. People say I'm just like my father or mother. Is that in good or bad ways? If it's good, keep it. <laughs> right. If it ain't so good, get rid of it. I struggle with holding grudges just like my mom did. Oh, what do you know? I guess I got my father's mean streak. What do you know? Huh? That's just the Irish temper in me. Do the Irish really have to have a bad temper? <laughs> really? I mean, does being Irish mean you drink a lot of beer and you stay mad? <laughs> And you like green? Green's your favorite color? Right. There you go. Cancer just runs in my family. Cancer doesn't run in Jesus' family. Oh, no. Does right. it? No. Does any sickness run in your new bloodline, church? No. No, it doesn't. Hmm. See, anytime, church, we see an attitude, action, or desire in us that does not glorify God, help us be more like Jesus, or strengthen those around us, please take time to ask Father, yeah. is this something I need to get victory over? Come on. All right. yeah. mm. Church, it'll cost you a lot to be the one who draws the line and says, no more. Yeah. This yeah. mess stops now, mm -hmm. and it stops with me, and it stops right here. Mm -hmm. It'll cost you something. Yeah. Yeah. But please, pay it. You pay it right now so your kids don't have to try to pay yeah. it. All right. Am I being too loud? I'm getting, no. I'm getting more excited. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, thank you. But church, that's one of the privileges we have as children of God is being a tradition breaker, being a birthplace of a brand new lineage. 
That's a privilege. It's a costly one, but it's a privilege, and it's a good thing. Do it. Please do it. Ah, hallelujah. Sometimes when we deal with stuff, we'll know immediately. I mean, I've, I've dealt with things and immediately noticed a new freedom. Sometimes I've dealt with stuff, and it took a while, like months or even a couple years, to actually feel and enjoy the full freedom. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's like a me, like, whoa, I'm free. And then later on, it's like you're still kind of, you've got the victory. Right. And it's not, it's not an eternal thing driving you. It becomes like an external irritation that you're constantly dealing with after your victory for a period of time until you enjoy the full freedom. Uh, sometimes it may take years to break its hold. But I'm telling you, from the time you draw the line and say no more and you deal with it in Jesus' name and you cover it with the blood of Christ, guess what? From that moment on, however long it takes, you're walking in victory and your kids are experiencing your victory. Hmm. Mm. Praise God. Oh, I wasn't planning on sharing this. Let me, let me say something here, okay? Um, there was a book I read years ago about the Vietnam War. I, I used to study a lot of stuff because I was a soldier for years. And things. this book, it was really a great book. You know, I think it's called Gorillas in the Mist. It was a, a guy, a special ops guy who wrote a book about his experience over there. And, uh, and he said when he went over, Mike shaking his head. Yeah. And the thing is, he... Um, he talked with one of the Vietnamese while he was over there, one of the people who basically who was res basically was resisting America, and, and, and we were, you know, it was, it was part of the war. And they asked him, said, why don't you guys give up? You're outgunned. <laughs> You're overpowered. I, we're so much technologically superior. And you know what the, 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 the enemy guy said? He said, we can outlast you. He said, you Americans, you like everything quick. He said, he said, if I don't win, my children will win. And if they don't win, our grandchildren will win. He said, he said, you Americans will not stay over here that long. Wow. Church? Wow. Do you have that attitude? Yeah. With sin, with bloodline things. Can you outlast them? Will you dig in your heels and say, Hallelujah, I'm going to get the win, or I'm going to fight till I breathe my last, and my kid will pick up where I leave off, and if he don't get it, my kid. Do you have that? Get it. Keep it. Keep it. We're in it. You know, we got one shot, guys. We got one time through this life. This is it. You get all the treasure stored up you can, but get all the wins for your family, those that will remain. All right. I know I'm out on my outline again. That's fine. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move a little quicker here. Church, there are no small victories in a child of God's life. Do you know that? Every win, it can be a small, itty, itty, bitty thing. It's huge. Everything's big. You've heard the straw that breaks the camel's back? Start throwing one straw at a time off if you have to. <laughs> Do it. Yeah. But... I'm going to close out the message today with one man's lineage and a thought, okay? One man's lineage. I want you to see this man's lineage and then just see if this bloodline thing's real. Jonathan Edwards, October 5th. He lived October 5th, 1703 to March 22nd, 1758. Look at this. This man, he only lived 55 years. You know what I'm saying? I'm 55. He, was only, he only lived 55 years. But let's look. Let's look at what he did, Okay. He was an American revivalist, preacher, and philosopher. Many believe him to be one of, if not America's greatest theologian, 55 years old. From his lineage. Well, I'm moving my, I'm moving my thing. I don't want anybody to miss this. All right. <laughs> Look closely and now think about your lineage, church. Wow. 13 college presidents, 65 professors, 3 U.S. senators, 30 judges, 100 lawyers, 60 doctors, 75 military officers, 100 ministers, 60 authors, one vice president, 80 public officials, and 295 college graduates. Wow. Did that man, Mr. Edwards, do you think he broke some traditions? Do you think he drew some lines and said, no more, Jesus, this stops here? Right. Mm. What can you do? Mm. What can you do? What can you do? I'm going to say it one more time. What can you do, yeah. church? Yeah. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. 
Thank you, God, that when you look at us, you see our lineage, God. You see mom and dad. You see our great, great, great grandparents, God. You see it all. You know it all, God. And thank you for the privilege, Lord, for us to, Lord, to just get wins, God, to get victories, God, to, to make you Lord of more spots in our life. Lord, so that, literally, Lord, so that our kids will start in a higher place. And if they're in a spot right now, Lord, as we get a win, they'll step into a higher place. As soon as we get that victory, our kids will step up. Our grandkids will step up. Thank you, God. Lord, we love you. We love you. We love you, God. Thank you for the privilege you give us, God, to, to go through this life and make a difference, God, for ourselves, for our families, for others. Lord, you, you really gave us a privilege of representing you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.